Okay, so Christmas. Snow's coming down. This is not the, over here. Um, so we, we are starting, yeah, somewhere else in Canada. Um, we are starting uh, Christmas season. Like, uh, how many of you have had your, well, our Christmas decorations went up first week in November. So I'm like, uh, what I'm trying to figure out is how does the little t- pine things from the fake trees, like you vacuum and you think it's clean. And then three minutes later, where you vacuumed, those little things, did you see the thing on Facebook where they've had this box of pine needles and then there's an empty tree? It's an Ikea Christmas tree where you have to stick them on this off, which, which is quite funny. But I mean, they seem to get everywhere. I don't know how they get everywhere. So um, this Christmas, we are going to focus on Christmas carols and we're going to sing Christmas carols in the service and we're going to sing Christmas carols before the service in our worship because Christmas carols for many of us carry a lot of tradition, a lot of value. Um, and as Montana said this morning, there's, there's so much value in the words that we're singing. But we're going to start off um, this week uh, with a carol, which I'm going to challenge you later on to see if you can recognize what the carol is. But here's something that I borrowed from Andy Stanley. Um, And what what he wrote was the intention of this was to include as many people as we possibly can. So this following statement, the hope of it is that I will include as many of you as I possibly can include um, in this following statement. Now, remember about three weeks ago, we spoke about offense. Um, Do not be offended and that your miracle lies on the opposite side. Just as you get over your offense, you're going to get your miracle. Now, if any of you feel offended that I left you out, When I read the list, just yell out the thing that I left out, where you felt left out in, and then we'll just add it to the list. We can just type it in, and then we'll be part of the list. Okay, so if all of you are ready, um, here we go. What do you call a group of porn-watching, tax-cheating, racist, judgmental, lonely, lying, cheating, greedy, covetous, lustful, jealous, angry people who eat too much, who spend too much, who drink too much, who medicate too much, who worry too much, who smoke too much, who blame other people for everything, who are always right, but who gather together because they believe Jesus is the light of the world and they need more light. What do we call them? The church. Did I get everybody? Everybody in there. Any other words you want to add to it that I might have just slipped up on? Nothing? Anybody? Yeah, I'm so glad that we could all laugh about that, which is great. So check step one, that worked. Right, it could have completely gone the other way. Um, but the reality is, is uh, that is, if you showed up to church and you're here for the first time, and maybe you've been here for a while, but, but you are not a Christian yet or a Christ follower yet, um, I want you to know, if you were any of those things, uh, all of us here, nobody here is perfect. We, we, don't, we, we are not Christians because we are perfect. We are Christians because we follow the one who is perfect, and he's busy changing our lives. But those things, they were involved in, I want to say, 99% of the people in this room, in our lives, we were in it. We were not somebody that just grew up and everything was perfect and we never had problems. Those, those things are relevant in our lives. And I, and I hope that by the end of the day, you, you would feel that, listen, I belong somewhere. Um, here's something else that you might have said and, and something that I've heard quite, quite a bit. And this is important to understand. I want you to feel included. But this is a, a statement that people make. They make the following statement. They say things like, the church ought to do this. Have you heard that statement? The church ought to do that. The church ought to take a stand on these issues. The church ought to take a stand on these issues. I hear that quite a bit when people say the church ought to take a stand on the issues. Uh, What they're really saying is the church ought to take my stand on these issues. Take my stand on it. Because then when they say to me the church ought to take a stand on these issues, and I say to him, can we take any stand or does it have to be your stand? No, it has to be my stand. Otherwise, the church shouldn't take any stand. If it's not my stand, don't take a stand. Right? Because we don't want the stand to be different than our stand. And, and here's another thing that you might know. Maybe you do not know this. Maybe you know this. I want you to hear, I, me, I am not the church. 
When you say the church ought to take a stand on this, whatever the issues are going on on the outside, I am not the church. We are the church. So when the church ought to take a stand on something, it's as a body, we need to take a stand on specific things, but not saying we're going to go to the newspapers and say we're going to take a stand. No, in our lives, we have to take certain stands as believers and followers of Christ. We have to take certain stands. Now, there's different ways to take a stand. There's, there's ways to do it in rebellion, or there's a way that I believe God wants us to do it, and we're going to look at that a little bit later. So besides the church taking the stand, um, the church, you have to understand what we have here today. Is it a place where everybody just agrees about everything? We don't agree on everything. The church is a gathering of a diverse group of people, a diverse cultures, diverse backgrounds, um, diverse opinions in in. North American um, culture, church culture, uh, for them, missions, if you look, think of the word mission, is sending people to Africa to go build a school. And then they, they, when they show up there, they spend, you know, thousands of dollars to get there. They spend five days to build one wall. Then they go on a safari and then they come back home, and there's some of them that really, they're there to love the people. I'm not doubting the, the reasons in their heart, but when they leave, the African people break down the wall because you built it wrong, because you're used to building with wood, we build with brick. Then they take what you've done, and they rebuild it for a quarter of the cost, and the rest of the money gets distributed to people. Which is, in our minds, we go, that's a good mission trip. We went, we built the wall, fantastic. In their minds is, that's a big load of money waste because you just spent almost $100,000 to get 10 people to come build a wall that we can build in one day that took you five days that we have to break down anyway. Now, in African people's mindsets, Africa right now, 85% evangelized. In our mindsets, missionary, being a missionary, is going to Canada and not building a wall. Well, that statement's a little weird, eh? <laughs> I don't know how that worked today. But, but the reality is it's not building. Like for us, missionary, there's different mindsets. It's, it's trying to influence people. So we have different opinions about things. Is the one right and the other wrong? No, the heart's content or the heart's be, behind it is, is right. But because we come from different places, our mindsets or our view about it will be different. The, jur- uh, the church, the church. The jerks. Um, The church is a gathering of imperfect people with different views and experiences who really don't agree on anything um, or everything. We agree basically just on two things. The two things that the church in general agrees upon. Number one, we agree that God sent his son into the world to pay for our sins, to forgive our sins. We believe Jesus Christ came so that we can be forgiven. And that is called mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is not getting what we deserve. What do we deserve? We deserve to be judged for all our mistakes, our sins, our failures, for not loving people, for not loving God, for not accepting Christ. Mercy is, I love this explanation. It's really for me the most practical one that I've found. You're driving 100 kilometers down the, the school zone, which is 30. Traffic officer pulls you over. He said to you, listen, you were speeding. You deserve to get a ticket, but I'm not going to give it to you. Um, Mercy is, I'm sinning, I'm hurting people, I'm letting people down, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting my relationships, I'm damaging the people around me, I'm falling short of what God's called me to do. Mercy is, you deserve to be punished for that. God is saying, you're not going to be punished for that. That's mercy. Christ paid so that we do not have to be punished for our mistakes. He took the payment on him. Mercy. The second thing that we agree upon is we believe that God sent His Son into the world, and when He did that, He extended something to us that we are now responsible to extend to other people. We are the first one we can extend to other people. I cannot pay for your sins, but grace is something we've been given the responsibility not just to keep to ourselves, but we're supposed to extend it to other people. So the second thing we can agree upon is grace. Mercy and grace is the two things that Jesus Christ came to establish when he came to the earth. Payment of sins and to live in undeserved favor. What is grace? Grace is getting what you don't deserve. 
And that's not like a spanking. Right? I remember that if my brother and I, something went wrong, and he said he didn't do it, I knew he did it. Because I was there. And I said I didn't do it. And because both of us said we didn't do it, we both got a spanking. That's not grace. That's cruelty. <laughs> right? But grace is, grace is, listen, same traffic officer pulls you over. Now, don't try this. Don't go in speed to see if you're going to get mercy and grace from a traffic officer. But let's say the first traffic officer pulls you over and says, listen, you were speeding. You're supposed to get a ticket. You're not going to get a ticket. And you go, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your mercy. He goes to his car. He gets out his checkbook. He comes back and he gives you $1,000. That's grace. So mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you don't deserve. God's unconditional love and favor. God loves you unconditionally. You do not deserve it. Not one of us have earned it. It's unconditional. That's what grace is. So we believe that, that we have two things. We've got mercy and we've got grace. We're going to focus on grace a little bit. Grace, um, when it comes to relationship and when it comes to us, is like oil in a machine. When God gave us mercy and grace, He knew we needed grace also. So grace is like when you have an, an engine um, and, and you've got the pistons and things and the plugs and the stuff, and it's like, as you can see, I really work a lot on cars. Um, but there's stuff that's moving, and they're fitting perfectly. The fittings are perfect. The, the one fits into the other one. But even though they fit perfectly, and they're exactly where they're supposed to be, if there's no oil between the two things that's supposed to work together, friction will build up, and that friction will cause it to heat up and eventually burn out or explode. We have had that. My wife, when one of our first cars, when the little oil light went on, she just thought, ah, it tells me I've got oil. <laughs> Which is actually quite the opposite. You do not have oil. Ladies, actually nowadays, any young man, guys, if the oil light goes, Jason, if the oil light goes on, you need to put oil in it. So, so oil for us is grace in relationship. Grace is the oil that we need in relationships. Well, um, some of you might be able to identify with me. When Ernie and I got married, we didn't live together before we got married. We, we got married and then we started living together. And there's something that they call the honeymoon period. The honeymoon period is not, not when you go on your honeymoon, it's when you come back and it is, it is basically the first two to three months of you moving in together. They call it, everything is just beautiful, All right? Everything is fantastic. Oh, look, he left his underwear on the carpet. <laughs> That's so nice, right? Yeah. She brushes her hair. Oh, just look at her hair. It's in the sink everywhere. <laughs> it's so cute. I love it. Oh, she leaves the toothpaste cap on the side and she squeezes it in the middle. Isn't that just so adorable? Yeah, I love it. She squeezes it, yeah. And then I have to roll it up to get all the tubes that's at the back to the front. I just love to. Now, our honeymoon period lasted about a week. <laughs> it did. It really did. When, before we got married, we had pre-marriage counseling. Pre-marriage counseling, we sat down, we did personality tests, and <laughs> it was quite funny. We, afterwards, there was a group of about eight couples that did it all together. Afterwards, you've got an interview with, with, the, with the guy leading it, relationship counselor, sitting down, looking at your personality test, and he said, wow. He says, you guys have like a 90% chance of your marriage not succeeding. I'm like, 90%? How can we score so low? Um, yeah, he said, one of you. She normally sits there. She's not there right now. Are super competitive. Now, I've got a little problem with my thumbs. Is like, when I, when I do this, it doesn't point there. And I, so I can do this with ease, and I know it was me. Right, can you do this? Yeah, come bend your thumbs over there. Keith, you're another weirdo. Alright, you also. Look at you. 
skill. Okay, so, so one of us had a competitive problem. We were a little bit over, like we, we like to compete. And even when we are wrong, and uh, why I'm saying we is because it feels more inclusive. Um, <laughs> even when we are wrong, we will do things to make us feel that we are right because we don't like losing anything. Don't like being wrong in the house, don't like losing an argument, don't like any of that. So for our first, I want to say, year, we battled through somebody being over-competitive. But thankfully, God's grace was there. Thankfully, God's grace was in our relationship because he's, He gave me the perfect wife um, that He knew I needed in order to one day be a husband and a father. Besides that, the fact that the guy told me we have a 90% chance of not succeeding made me more determined than anything. This will work. I don't care if you're unhappy, this will work. Right? Yeah. I was like, no, super determined. Grace is also like the oil for the local church. Because in this group right here, like I've said, the church is not an institution. The church is not the pastor. It's not the name. The church is the people that are gathered together that have different opinions and views. So we need grace together to go for the vision that God gives us. And we're going to do it in different ways. And we must have grace when we come and when we, when we want assistance and help and in our struggles. We need grace in our difficulties. And, and it's one of the, the things that I think left the church for a long time. Because people would come with their issues. And instead of extending grace, we, we would serve up judgment. And that way people leave. Because instead of us encouraging, equipping, helping, supporting, getting them through it, helping them um, struggle with their struggles, um, people were put off by the church and they left the church. Grace allows people who aren't alike to get along in such a way that they are able to do amazing things together. Grace allows you to like people who you don't like. It does. It allows you to get along with people who you don't get along. So, so the amazing thing is the reason we talk about grace over Christmas is because our Heavenly Father initiated grace when He sent Jesus Christ. He didn't just send Jesus with mercy. He sent Jesus with grace also. Our Father knew that we needed oil for our relationships, not just with each other, but also for, with Him. Because if we kept thinking that we have to earn earn the blessing in our lives, we will fall short all the time. But when we understand that God's grace is the oil that gives us the, the ability to have God's unde undeserved favor in everything that we do, it helps us to understand that we didn't earn it. Jesus is the gift that, that was given to us for us to have grace in our lives. See if you can recognize um, the, the following song. Uh, God and sinners reconciled. Thank you, Sherry. Very good. Do you guys know the song? I said it so the, the, the rhythm, if I said, God and sinners reconciled. How many of you would have guessed it? Yes. Okay. So that's why I was practicing the whole morning. God and sinners reconciled. It's tricky, right? So, so here's the song. We all know. Hark the herald angels sing. Wait, I'm going to have to start it low. You're not going to reach it. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Now, Hark wasn't his name. 
<laughs> Just some people were wondering, who's this archangel? And oh, Gabriel and Michael. Um, but this song really speaks about something that God did for us. He reconciled us back to God. He gave us something so that we can have a healthy relationship with our Father. And it wasn't just taking care of our sin. It wasn't just, listen, your sin has been dealt with. It was an ability for us to live in undeserved favor right now. That's what grace means. I am living a life that has undeserved favor in it right now. Which is amazing. So, at Christmas we celebrate the reconciliation of God and sinners. Um, and it could not happen without mercy and grace. And for sinners, us, being able to receive all that God has for us requires oil that grace provides. And every single one of us, there's not a person in this room that can say, I don't need it. Now, aren't you glad that Jesus, Jesus didn't just come just to make us right, but he also came so that we can live a life filled with blessing, filled with God's favor, undeserved favor in every area. God's grace is invisible. If grace was something I can show you on stage as a visible thing, most of us would be able to point it out and say, yes, I want it. The only place you will be able to see grace is when you look at relationships. Grace is invisible without relationships. That's why it's so important for us to be connected with each other. Because it is in our connections that grace becomes visible. That's why it's important for you, if you're not part of a church or a place where grace is extended, get become part of one. Grace is most, most amazing when it shows up in relationships between um, people that not necessarily have the same points of view. You are amazing. You hear me? You're amazing. Every single one of you, you are amazing. So thank you. Yeah. But you are more amazing. You are most amazing when you extend grace to others. Do you realize how amazing that is? If you want to, like, you are amazing. Like, there's people here, oh, you guys are amazing. But you are most amazing when you extend grace. You are most like your Father in heaven when you extend grace. We are called to be a reflection of, of the one that we look into the mirror. And the one, when we look in the mirror, which is the Bible for us, we look in the, in the Bible and we see Jesus Christ, and that's a reflection that we want to see. We are most like Christ when we extend grace. We're going to do, this is amazing grace next week. We won't do it this week. But God's amazing grace to you is an invitation for you to be amazing. This Christmas is an opportunity for you to be amazing. When's the last time you were told you're amazing? Besides this morning. Like you're amazing. And I'm not talking about your wife. Yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> When's the last time somebody came to you and said, yeah, I just want to tell you like, what you did, that was amazing. Christmas is an opportunity for us to be amazing. And, and it, it's because of grace. Grace is the way you become amazing. Extending grace to other people is not easy for some of us. Yes, I know. It's not easy, more specifically, extending grace to certain people. Certain people you really strug, struggle with extending them grace. Uh, certain kinds of people. Certain groups of people that you don't agree with. Certain people who embrace certain behaviors, certain people or groups who remind you of something or someone who hurt you in the past. It's really hard to extend grace to them. All of us, I want you, we're going to do a group exercise. Close your eyes right now and I want you to think of a person or a group to whom it is very difficult or challenging or might even seem impossible 
to extend grace to. I want you to picture that person or that group right now. Okay, good. Do you know why it's hard for you to extend grace to them? Okay, you can open your eyes. No sleeping. <laughs> you know why it's hard? Jesus tells us why it's hard to extend grace to certain people, to certain groups, to a certain someone. He tells us, and if you're a Christian, this is going to account for you. If you're not a Christian and you're here today, I just, you've got the opportunity to just watch and observe everybody else. Now, now I want to be clear. This is Jesus saying it. This is not me. This is not me saying this is what you have to do. This, these words, they come out of the mouth of Jesus. So, the question, why is it difficult for most of us to extend grace to somebody or to a certain group of people or to a certain person, somebody specific? Why is it most difficult? Matthew 7 verse 3 tells us why. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Let me read it again. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? I want to say again, this is Jesus saying this. This is not me. Uh, this is an important question. Um, I am just the mouthpiece. Don't kill the drummer or the guitar player or the piano player. We are just people. Uh, when people are saying difficult things that challenge you in your heart, don't leave the place that's saying it. We, we are simply here to try and encourage and help you to get through life so that you can live in all the fullness of it and not miss out on anything. So why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Why do you focus? Why do you, why do you, you know, you look Specifically, why do you give all the attention and get so amped up? You get so ramped, so stirred up emotionally, like you get emotional um, about a little itty bitty tiny little thing, right? This small little thing that your brother's doing wrong or that's in your brother's eye, um, that's in somebody else's eye that you pay attention to and this issue like it becomes something that disturbs you and rubs you the wrong way and it becomes your problem and it becomes, it influences your habits, it influences your attitudes. And why do we do that? The number one reason we do it, number one, is what people will say, Andreas, number one, that's not a speck. That's not a speck of sawdust. That right there is a mountain of lumber. I'm looking at my brother, and there is a mountain of timber in his eye. That is not a speck. He is a liberal that likes both faces. He is a conservative that wants to hold us back. She is a Republican, and she watches Fox News. I drove by a house, I saw it on. He is a Democrat and he is tuned into CNN. Like you don't understand. Do you know what's going on in their lives? It is relevant, people. Listen, politics, I, we don't bring politics into the church and we don't speak towards it. But it is dividing church people. It's dividing people into different groups where it's not supposed to be. You are allowed to have your view and your opinion. We have diverse backgrounds and, and values. That's okay. But for some of us, when we look at it, we go, that is not a speck. That is a mountain of, of lumber that I cannot ignore. More personal, more closer to your own, own life might be. Andreas, it is not a speck when your dad walks out on you when you are five years old. And the only time you see him again is when he comes back and he's got no money for alcohol. And now you are grown up and suddenly you have to care for him because nobody else wants to do it. That is not a speck. That is massive. Uh, it's not a speck when somebody abused you or hurt you. Uh, when you look at them, that is not a speck. That is massive. Andreas, it's not a speck. These things are big to us. Secondly, the second reason, I do not have a plank in my eye. That is not a speck, and I don't have a plank. 
I am well informed. I see the world the way it really is. I understand how things really work. I know what's going on. I am well informed. I was told by my cousin who heard it from my uncle <laughs> that his wife spent time with the pastor and at lunchtime, the pastor said that that lady said that about you. I know it's well informed. I got the information from somebody. I am well informed about what's going on in this world. I, w I watch every program and all the information I'm getting. I am so well equipped with the information I have what's going on in the world. I am well informed. I know everything. And what we think is that we are not influenced by our experience or our education or our health or our lack of health or our health struggles. We think that we're not influenced by our successes or somebody else's failures or your own failures. You think you're not influenced by your insecurity or somebody else's insecurities. You think you're not influenced by your opportunities or your lack of opportunities. You think you're not influenced by your IQ. We are. Jesus is talking to you. And he's talking to me. Every single one of us in this room have a plank in our eye. Nobody is excluded. Not one person in this room can go, that's not for me. Jesus isn't done yet. He goes on and he says, how can you say to your brother, your brother-in-law, to your sister, to your sister-in-law, to your neighbor, to the guy at work, to the woman at work, to the neighbor with the, with the ugly dog, to the neighbor with the cats, with the, the neighbor who plays loud music, um, to the person that used to be your best friend, but they took something from you, to your best friend who took somebody else's girlfriend that's not supposed to take their girlfriend and now they've gone off with their girlfriend. How can you say to that person that let you down or disappointed you in such a way, how can you say to that person, let me take the speck out of your eye. Let me help you see clearly. Let me explain to you how the world really is and how things really work. Let me tell you how things are going to go in your life. Let me tell you what you ought to do. Let me tell you how you ought to think, who you're supposed to support, how you're supposed to stand, where you're supposed to stand. Let me tell you what, what you should have done so that you won't be in this mess that you're in right now. Let me help you see the world the way it really is because I see the way the world really is. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? And then he goes on, you hypocrite. You hypocrite. You sinner. You do it over and over again, -er. purposefully. -er. You fall shorter. Yeah. Do you know why God is able to extend grace to you in spite of you? Do you know why he's able to extend grace to every single one of us in spite of what we've done? Do you know why he decided to send his son into this world to pay for our, all our sins, all our shortcomings? And so that you and I can be reconciled God and sinner reconciled through grace. Because he could see you and me for exactly who we are. I know many of us like, uh, I, I do believe that we are all striving in our lives to be good people. Even people who aren't Christian want to be good people. But I do believe that when God looks at us, and I, and I want you just, just to, uh, let's reset, start over. Wherever your thoughts are right now, if it's not focusing on, on being everything that God has called me to be right now, listening to this word, because the word is confrontational for some of us. It's a confrontational word. 
Because we think it's okay to look at certain people and judge them for what they've done. We are not called into the ministry of judgment. We're called into the ministry of reconciliation. That is a family member, a brother, a sister, a neighbor, a, a sibling, a business partner, somebody. You are called into the ministry of reconciliation with every single one of them. And no one is excluded from that reconciliation. Every single person in your life that has hurt you, disappointed you, fallen short of the mark in your life, based on what God says, needs your reconciliation. You did not deserve the reconciliation that we received from Christ. None of us deserved it. Not one person in this room. Do you know how many mistakes I've made in my life? Man, when I was a performer, um, before Emery and I got married, I toured the South Africa, Europe, toured everywhere. The amount of mistakes I've made, I think if we put all of yours together, you're like halfway. Yet, today I can stand and I can be your pastor. And none of you are judging me for my past. Because my desire is to follow Christ. Our past is not supposed to influence the view that we have of people. When we look at people, we should look at them the way God looks at us. He sent His Son to die for every single one of our mistakes. That means for every person that's ever harmed you, their mistakes also. Grace is your opportunity to be amazing. God's called us to be amazing. The Apostle Paul writes it and he says it the following way. Um, but God puts on a demonstration. He says demonstrates, which means he put on a demonstration. It wasn't that God just said it and God said, I love you. Or God wrote a letter in which he said, I love you. The following is a demonstration. It is an action, an act of doing something. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While I was still falling short, while I was still making mistakes, while I was still, and this means right now, He died for you. Every single person you can think of that's ever wronged this world, he died for them also. While I was still sinners, Christ died for us. And this wasn't future tense. This was present right now. God demonstrates his love for us in this. Knowing ahead of time, knowing ahead of time the sins we would commit and confess and repeat and confess and repeat and confess again, Christ died for us anyway. God was able to take your whole story into account and he gave you what you deserved least but what you needed the most. And then he says to you and he says to me, come on, I want you to do what I have done for you. I want you to do that for others. Now, the goal of this message is not for you to leave here today and to go, you know what, yeah, I'm really going to try harder. I'm going to be, you know, when I sit around the dinner table on Christmas Eve, I'm not going to fold my arms my, and have a frown on my face in my in-law's home. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, like, loosen up a bit, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be nicer, right? I'm going to be nice, and I'm going to really work hard at being nicer. The goal is not for you to go home and think I'm going to try and be nicer. He gives us instructions on how we should do this. He, said, he says, first, he gives us a list. First, before you try to figure out how to extend grace to someone else, before you try to figure out how to take the little sawdust out of your brother's eye, before you do that, before you extend grace, you will never get it right unless you first take the plank out of your own eye. And then and only then will you see clearly enough to know how to extend grace to the people who need it, but don't deserve it. I want to ask again, did Jesus exclude anybody from grace? Do you? Uh, 
you know, we, we deal sometimes with marriages that break up and um, the anger and the hurt and the pain is real for people. I do not think that what you are feeling and that hurt is not real. But God gives you an opportunity to be amazing. Now, I was actually quite excited this morning because I couldn't wait to share the guilt with you guys. <laughs> yeah, because this is a difficult question, right? So, so, so here's the question. What are the planks that you are carrying around? What are the planks? Because there are people um, I, I have a hard time with. There's certain people that I struggle with. And by God's grace has been fantastic because he's given me the ability to... to um, it's getting easier and better and easier and like I can breathe. So sometimes, you know, in the past, I, I was, I, I could be tense or intense um, sometimes, um, especially when you are in a debate um, and um, our table around our, 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 our house table, first time Emery ever sat down when we started dating and she came to our house and we sat around the, the dinner table as a family. She thought we were having full on war, but that's just how we talk <laughs> in our house. In our house, it's like, you're wrong, I'm right, shut up, right? And everybody's like that. So there were eight people making the same conversation. And everybody's like, oh my goodness, what is this family that I'm getting involved with? Um, so there are certain people, and God's grace has helped me to get to, to the place where I recognize, listen, I've got planks that I have to get rid of. If there's certain people that I judge uh, or, or rule out of love before I even get to have a relationship with them, means that there's things that I have to, to deal with. So Jesus' question, um, his, his question is way longer then mine, his is, why do you try to take a speck of sawdust out of your brother's eye when you still have a plank in your eye? My question is a little bit shorter. My question is, got planks? <laughs> Need help to get rid of them? Got planks. This is why he says, listen, first, 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 before you take a speck out, you've got to examine your own heart. You've got to exam examine what is in your own eye. First, you've got to remove the plank before you try to extend grace. First, remove the Because why would I want to take a speck of so out of somebody else's eye? And that's the heart's condition. Most of the time, when, we, when we've got planks, I try to take the speck out not because of grace. I try to take the speck out because I'm right. And you're wrong. And let me just take that for you. But in the process, you actually hurt the person. If you take the plank out, you will see clearly. And then you will know. You will know better. You will have greater insight. Um, and I actually think if you extend it to people who don't deserve grace, you are able to change their lives. I'm still learning this. I am. I'm still learning this. And this is what I'm, I'm learning, and this is what's, what's helping me in my own process. And I hope this will help you also, because I haven't gotten to the place to how do you get rid of the planks. This is what I'm learning. The more I am aware of what God is doing or is yet to do in me. Um, in other words, the more I spend time looking in the mirror, which is for me God's word, the more I look at Christ... And I look at how he conducted himself and, uh, himself and what he did to people and whom he loved. And even up to the point of being on the cross, um, beaten beyond recognition. You can't even recognize him. Being spat, ridiculed, mocked. Um, his flesh, they said you couldn't recognize him being a person because he was beaten so badly. Nailed to a cross, he he's, was persecuted wrongly, nothing, he didn't deserve any of it, but he's on the cross. And in that state of being on the cross, he says, God, one of the most amazing places in the Bible for me is being in that absolute place of pain and disagreement. His words is, God, forgive them. 
for they do not know what they're doing. So for me, the more I look in the mirror, the, the more time I spend um, listening to good teaching, the more time I spend with listening to fantastic praise and worship music, spending time with people around me in whose lives I can see grace and God's goodness and God's kindness, the more time I spend surrounding myself with Christ, the more I become aware of the planks in my own life and the less I become aware of the specks in other people's lives. Because God has called me to be in control of me. I am supposed to be the best example of Christ that people, I am not called to make you the best example of Christ you're supposed to be. My responsibility is me. What am I showing people when I walk on the street? What am I showing people when I'm in conversation? What am I showing people when I get up upset about stuff that I'm not supposed to get upset about? I'm supposed to be a reflection of grace to people. In fact, not only do I become less aware of other people's specs, I also become less offended by it. It's really true. When I focus on my own mistakes, my own shortcomings, the areas where I'm supposed to work on in my relationships with God and with people, the impact I'm supposed to have on other people, I am not so offended by your shortcomings because I'm focused on mine. And my desire is to be amazing for you. God has called us to be amazing. And at Christmas, grace came to earth. At Christmas, grace came to earth to dwell with us, in spite of us, but in us. He wants you to be his extension of it. Isn't it interesting that, that God was, was more broken hearted over our sins than he was put off by it? I want to say that again. Because that for me is, is something big. Because... That's one of the biggest, we are so put off by the people that hurt us. God was more broken hearted by it than put off by it. He felt more passion and compassion for us than saying, oh, I want nothing to do with them. Oh, no, don't, don't be, I don't want to be close to them. It, it breaks his heart, and we should have that same compassion. He sent his son into the world to pay for our sins so God and sinners could be reconciled. Jesus drew near, even though we by choice have been far away. Jesus was full and is full of, full of grace and truth. He is. What are you full of? Yeah, I mean, in your heart, right? What comes out? What comes out when you get shaken up? What comes out when somebody just stirs you or rubs you a little bit? It's like you can see in a conversation. I, you've seen certain people. I can visibly see people that if you just, we use the term, rub them the wrong way. What happens? No oil. There's no grace. Sparks fly. Suddenly, they become explosive. They just want to hurt you. And what happens is because of, of my focus and my awareness of the things out there, I become so stirred up by those things instead of focusing on what Christ is doing in me so that I can be amazing for other people. We get stirred up and robbed the wrong way and then suddenly we become angry and violent. And we hurt the relationships where we're supposed to mend them. What comes out when people do things differently than the way you're supposed to do them? So, so here's the question. When people think about, about you, what, what would they think? When people think about me, what would they think? Here's a question that's very important. When people think about the name of the church and they run into you, and they find out where you go as a church, what comes to their minds? What are they thinking? 
The church is most appealing when we are gracious. We are so attractive when we are people of grace. And the reason why people will push back against Christianity, if you had to invite them to any of the events that we're doing, the reason people will push back, I want to guarantee you, I will stop drinking coffee for a day. I like big commitment. No, for a month, for the rest of my life, if you can show me one thing that Jesus said or did that was not done in love, show me one thing. People are not put off by Jesus. They are put off because the church, instead of being an extension of God's grace, we became an extension of judgment. And we are not called to be an extension of judgment. We're called to be an extension of grace. Even with people who we completely disagree with. So, the church is always more appealing when grace is, is, is there. We are the church. As I started off earlier, I am not the church. You are the church. Every single day, every single place we go, we are the church. So the question is, are you ready to remove the planks? Are you willing to remove the planks? Or are certain issues for you too important that you cannot not be offended by somebody who disagrees with you? Or somebody who's hurt you in the past? Are you willing to remove the planks of somebody who might have hurt you 15 years ago? Or 20 years ago? Or last week? Are you willing to let go of those? I know there are people that we think they have planks in their eyes, but, but the intention of the heart when, when we get to that place of wanting to remove something from them should not be because we want to correct them. It should come from the heart because we want to love them. We are called to love people. Love them. Don't have to agree with them. Love them. Doesn't mean that there's not right and wrong. Yes, there is right and wrong. But it's in the way that we, we um, communicate it. In the way that God has communicated with me in my life, He's never been violent. He's never been demeaning. He's never been angry, filled with wrath towards me. He's been patient. He's been kind, he's been generous, he's been loving, he's been gentle, he's been always present, never absent, and I've been wrong. There's big steps right now, steps towards healing, right? I've been wrong many times, yet through all of those times, I had undeserved favor in my life. My whole life. And that is what we've been called to during this Christmas season and this season that we, this, these boxes, I know some of you are struggling saying, we don't know who we're going to give boxes to. Listen, it's not that hard. It's really not. Drive out to any shopping mall. And today I want to challenge you. Go walk through, Fresco's not open yet. Sorry, Michael. Next week, Thursday. Drive through any shopping, um, grocery store, just for, go walk around for half an hour. I am convinced you will find somebody who you can bless. Just walk, you don't have to know them. You don't have to. Just go, go to um, McDonald's. Go sit at McDonald's for an hour, have a coffee and a very nutritional Big Mac. Look for somebody who's counting out their cents. You'll be able to bless them. Yeah, but what about the executive? I don't have people that's in need. Fantastic. Then go across the street to your neighbor who you are supposed to be super close to, supposed to influence, supposed to love, to, supposed to have a love. And you don't just have one. You have one, two. So easy. It's so easy. And if you still don't have somebody, take your two boxes on December the 15th, get in your car and you drive and you go, God, which homes? 
Where do you want me to go? Now, don't just take option C because it seems the easiest. Think about it. Pray about it. Be intentional. Be intentional with your grace. Be intentional with who we want. We as a church are supposed to reach people. We're supposed to change the language that they have about the church. We're supposed to be a place that when they speak of Numa as a body, us being the church, man, those people are gracious and inviting and kind and they are gentle and accepting and loving and kind and they're not bitter and they invite us and they welcome us in and they are patient with us we're coming in with all our addictions and our mistakes and they stayed gentle and loving and kind and they never changed and and it took me years before i got to the place where i accepted christ in my life but man i felt so loved every time i was in there it influenced and changed my life There's no membership card at the door. Christ died for every single sinner there is, which is all of us. All of them are welcome. So this Christmas, let's extend grace to people. There's somebody that you need to invite. There's somebody that you need to apologize to for things that you've said. There's somebody that, get that plank out of your own eye first. Start with that. Allow relationship to be restored. And then through relationship, man, what's going to happen? You are so gently going to help them to get through those little things that's irritating their eyes. But it takes time. And we're not going anywhere. We're patient. Because God's patient with us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and we thank you for your kindness. And my question to you is, are you ready to um, take grace home with you today? Like your lights are up, your trees are up, everything is ready. Are you ready for grace to come to town? This year, are you ready for grace to come to your home and to your town? Grace really is the solution for just about everything that you've got. Jesus extended grace to us. Thank you so that we can extend it to others. God, help us to extend it to others. And Father, this Christmas, I pray that you will give us the strength and the ability to extend our love to someone who don't expect it. and possibly what they don't really deserve. But I pray, Father, that we will do this because that is what you did for us when you sent Jesus. Thank you, God, that you've given us an opportunity to be amazing. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Listen, you are amazing. You are amazing. Now, be amazing in your grace also. I want to invite you to come for prayer. The people up front, they would love to pray for you, pray with you. Um, um, If you need anybody to stand with you during this week, there might be something that you're going through. You need somebody to agree with you about what God is doing in your life. I want to encourage you to come to them. They would love to be there for you in those moments also.